This is Chris Idaho, painter here on Paint Life TV. Today I got a really cool video. It's not about boxing, but this is all about cabinet painting. If you're a professional or a do it yourself or you have any questions about painting cabinets, this is the video for you. It's not short. This is a long video because it's all about cabinet painting from the sanding to the prep to applying grain filler to spraying vertical to spraying horizontal. So grab yourself a soda or grab yourself a beer. Get yourself a bowl of popcorn or some chicken wings and check this video out because this is going to give you a lot of tips and tricks when it comes to painting cabinets like a pro. So stay tuned for this video. One of the things I really like is, is spraying with a remote pot. And this is a remote pot right here. Instead of having a cut gun, you know, this is a small cut gun. You can have one on the top or you can have like a quart pot on the bottom. It gives you a lot more flexibility if you don't have you know, a cup attached to your gun and you're just using the gun itself and your hoses run to a remote pot. It's just gonna make your gun more flexible. You're gonna be able to get in and inside, in and out of cabinets a lot easier. In the, the Precision 5, they've come out with this system right here. This attaches to the top and your remote pot actually sits right here on this unit right here all in one and I don't have to have that remote um, pot hanging from my belt or hanging from my pants pocket. This is an essential accessory, I think, when it comes to painting cabinets. I absolutely love this. Once you've tried this system, I don't think you'll ever go back. We're gonna put this together. I'm gonna show you what it looks like put together. Here's um, a couple other accessories. We're always, I don't think there's any time I'm ever using an HVLP sprayer and I'm not thinning my products. I'm always thinning them to some extent and you really need a viscosity meter. Here's um, a couple examples of some viscosity meters. This is a Ford 4 right here and um, this one right here. This is a Zon right here. As I believe this is a Zon 2 and this is a Ford 4. Ford Ford. I really like this. This is an Apollo Zon 2. I really like the um, viscosity meters right here that Apollo has because you can see it's got a nice long wire attached to it. You can easily dip it down in your products. You're not going to get your hands in it. And this is a great measuring tool. It's made out of metal. This thing is going to last you. You shouldn't have to ever buy you know, more than one. These are two Ford 4s that I have that are plastic. They're going to do the same thing. They just got to, they measure you know, um, a different um, a different way. So if you're gonna be um, cross-referencing them, you need a cross-reference chart to cross-reference a Ford from a Zon because the timetables are actually different. But a must-have, you should always be thinning or almost always be thinning your products, especially latex products, when it comes to um, using an HVLP sprayer. So it's a must-have tool. Here's another must-have tool, and it's a, a mill thickness gauge. And you really should be knowing you know, how much product you're actually spraying on your um, surface or your substrate that you're spraying with. This is a mill thickness gauge, and if you've never used one, you know, um, I'll eventually show a video on how you use these things. But um, this is a little metal mill thickness gauge, but you really should have a mill thickness gauge and you should learn how to use them. So those are two things right here. Here is another handy little device I'm gonna show you. And this is a um, cone filter cup holder and you really should be straining your paints too. So straining your paints could be messy, but you can take your remote pot, you can set it right under your cone filter and set this holder right there. Now you can dump your product in there. You don't sit there and have to have hold that cone filter in it. You can fill it up, walk off, go do whatever you need to do and just let it set there. This is another great tool, great accessory. I got this from Apollo right here. It has you know a couple different size stands so you can have a taller one or you can make it a shorter one. So it's a, it's a filter stand. Those are some accessories right there. Everybody should have with, um, you know, using a um, HVLP sprayer. Another accessory that you should have, PPS cup system. This makes spraying the cleanup process a lot easier and interchanging from products. So this is a PPS system right here. Um, I've got a couple right here that step out of the screen. Here's some um, liners that go into the PPS cups and they've got um, little lids that go on them. They're sealed. These have been um, sealed here. I was uh, testing some products and 
you know, several weeks older and they're still ready to go can be used once again. That's part of the PPS system. So there you have it, the remote pot setup that's actually on your sprayer now. Absolutely amazing, um, amazing unit. I got two other accessories I wanna show you real quick. And these are great accessories also to have with your HVLP sprayers. One of them is a blow off tool. Now you can use the hose on your HVLP sprayer and on the Apollo sprayer, this hose, everything's coming through this hose, it's uh, filtered air. So you're not gonna get any dust particles or any contaminants by blowing off with this tool and it's warm air so it's gonna help dry your um, project or your surface a little bit quicker. But it's coming out of a very large orifice. This blow off tool is excellent. I absolutely love this thing, quick release stick it on there. Now you have a smaller orifice, a better blow off tool and Apollo's made it. So you've got a quick release attachment. You have two attachments right here on the top of your um, sprayer, your HVLP sprayer, one for your gun and one for your blow off tool, just like that. So that thing won't get lost. That's a great accessory to have with your HVLP sprayer. And another thing is you're going to have to have every time at the end of the job, you need a great quality cleanup um, kit. And the cleanup kit is gonna have all kinds of brushes for all the little orifices and stuff inside this gun to clean it out properly. If you don't clean out your gun properly, you're just gonna have problems next time you go and use it. Here's a cleanup kit that I have from Apollo right here. There's actually um, two cleanup kits in here. So there's a lot of different tools, different size brushes and stuff for cleaning these orifices different size tools for getting in and cleaning out. You need to have some type of uh, cleaning kit. There's a, even a pick inside this one. So have a cleaning kit, have those tools. So there's some of the tools and accessories that you need to really have when it comes to um, running an HVLP sprayer. A lot of these tools and accessories down in the video description below. I have links where you can get some of these accessories. I'm going to give you just a little brief history of how I used to paint cabinets. I've been doing it for over 18 years and we used to just take and search out and find as many five gallon buckets as we can, as many boxes as we can, and we would spray our door drawer fronts or doors. We would spray them sitting on those buckets and boxes. We would let it dry, come back the next day, we would flip it, we would spray that side, we would let that dry, come back the next day, and then we would rehang our doors. Now that was a three-day system. We eventually um, designed the system how we can spray a door in one day, hanging it. And that was um, done with PVC pipe. We made it with PVC pipe. It was very unstable. Uh, we used uh, wooden hangers and had them break before. We had the, the hangers come out here and we had them break here. That's why there's tape wrapped around them to make them stronger. It was a great system. It made us um, money. It, it turned our painting process from three days into one day. But eventually, um, Paintline saw the video and they manufactured this system right here that I'm surrounded by. They manufactured um, better hangers. The system tears down extremely fast. You'll see here, I'll break it down. It breaks down in about five minutes. It takes less than 10 minutes to set this system up. It comes in three bags. The whole system, it's an extremely professional look when you walk into a house you know, with the bags. The poles go in a bag, this bag right here. The hangers are right here. It comes with 50 hangers. So here's the hanger bag right here. And everything is very neatly organized. And everything goes together, no tools. This just sets in and everything's color coded too. So it's really hard not to be able to figure out how to put it together. A cotter pin just puts in the part that spins, it's got notches for the hanger right here. So the notches are really important that it doesn't slide around. It just goes in, cotter pin goes in. It's got, it comes with two wooden dowels so you can spin your door right here. I like to just take and stick tape around the dowel so it's a little bit tighter. Here's a door, so here's the hanger itself. These hangers are absolutely incredible. The hangers themselves, we have a system by where we actually drill cup hooks right here we'll, and put cup hooks in the top of the doors. The wooden hangers, you see when you hang um, a door on there, the door turns, it spins right here. So it take up a whole lot more room and space for hanging your cabinet doors. The system with the, the 
hangers out on the paint line, they don't spin. So these hangers take up way less space. So I can hang these things. You can see they don't spin, they're fixed in place. I can hang them very tight together, just like that. They're not gonna spin, not gonna touch each other. This is gonna typically be set up in a spray booth. The sprayer is going to spray, he's going to hand it outside the spray booth. The hanger is going to, um, the guy, he's going to take and hang it on a drying rack, usually in a separate room for them to dry. It's probably my favorite accessory, it's a two tier system. And this is one of the you know, ones I um, called paint line up and told them, you know, we got all these drawer fronts, and the drawer fronts are only about this tall. And they're only taking up that space. I said, it'd be really be nice to be able to utilize the space below it and hang another row of drawer fronts. So it was literally like that, I think that same day they came up with a, you know, um, engineered drawing of the system. And here it is, I'm gonna show you. It comes, this the two tier uh, system right here. It, it's four pieces and these are the tops and this is the middle right here. And this is what's gonna create the second tier. So I'm just gonna take my first dry rack. I'm gonna take that off and all I'm gonna do is take Top off, I'm gonna slide this piece down. I can put it anywhere I want to create my second tier. And this would be like if you're doing you know, small parts, door fronts. Now I can take, hang, you know, small door. Now I can hang a large door down here. Two tier system right here. So a height extender. Here's a height extender. So this is what it looks like right here. So the height extender, I'm just gonna take my top off, just stick a height extender in. And what this would, you know, come to play is we've done in the past, I've done some um, shutters. So some plantation shutters that were really tall. They were too tall to hang on the PSDR system as it stands now. So the height extenders, this would have given us enough height to actually hang our, and uh, put our plantation shutters on. So sort of take out top, this one, so now, it's just extending my height by a foot right here. Got a height extender in. Um, I can just turn around and remove my two-tier system. Now I've got an extended height. So that's another accessory that Paintline has just recently come up with to make this system more versatile. Now I'm gonna show you uh, the wave hanger. I know, um, there's a handful of people out there that do not like drilling holes in their cabinet doors. I've been doing it for probably seven, eight years, something like that. I've had one customer ever question it. The secret is on the top doors, screw your holes in the top, bottom drawer doors, screw your holes in the bottom, and nobody will ever see them. So an EFC hanger, this right here, this hanger goes right inside your round, Hinge hooks just sets right inside there, just like that. Now you don't have to drill holes in your cabinet doors. The wave hanger goes along with this EFC system because the wave it's going to just set in there just like that. No more drilling holes. The wave hangers kind of just find you know where the hanger needs to hang because it's going to be the hole is going to be anywhere. So you actually need a hanger like this wave hanger to be able to hang your doors. So now wave hanger, system, EFC hooks, no longer have to drill holes. And today I'm gonna to talk about how to get a glassy smooth finish on wood oak grain cabinets. One of the products I use to achieve that glassy smooth finish is Aquaco. And this is a product I've been using for quite a few years. It used to be clear, so you would apply it on your surface and you really couldn't see where you went and where you needed to sand very well. Now, this has got a couple coats on it. Now you can see it's white and it has this white pigment in it. So it's very easy to see where you've applied it and what you need to sand. It does bond a lot better than it used to and it has more solids in it. So you don't have to apply as many coats as you used to in the past. It comes in pints, it comes in quarts, and it also comes in gallons. Right here, here's a gallon of it. Uh, average size kitchen cabinets is probably gonna use about a quart. So this is what you'd use for average size 
uh, set of kitchen cabinets. You can apply it on painted surfaces. So if you make the mistake of applying or painting your cabinets before applying aqua coat and they look really grainy, you can put your aqua coat right over the top of a painted surface. The painted surface just needs to be cured. So these are lacquered cabinets right here. We're gonna sand them first, then clean them, and then apply our aqua coat. And I'm gonna talk about the tools that we use to apply it right now. So onto the tools that I use for applying the aqua coat. I like a, an assortment of squeegees and I've got a set right here. These I purchased from a local hardware store. They're nice, flexible. I do like plastic or rubber squeegees versus metal because metal is more likely to scratch or gouge your surface. I got them with handles, got them without handles, and then I also have some odd shaped ones and these are kind of to use to remove decals or uh, window tinting on windows. I got them from a local window tinter. Very simple. In the past, I used to use just an old credit card to apply it with. Works very well because they're flexible. They're small and they bend really easily. I like to have a size that I can scoop out my aqua coat with uh, a squeegee that will reach in and scoop it out. So I like one that fits inside like a quart container. If I'm using a quart, this one will fit right in there. You'll, do, you'll want to do some sanding. You're gonna need some glasses right here, safety glasses. I use a rag, like a microfiber towel to apply it in hard to get areas. I've got a sander right here. I really like using the surf prep sander because it has these type of sponges that attach hook and loop right to the sander and it contours to routed edges or recessed panel doors very easily. It makes the sanding really fast and efficient. You're gonna use 320 sandpaper to sand in between coats of aqua coat because you're typically gonna apply at least two coats, sometimes three. One coat typically is not enough. I start off with either a 180 or a 150 grit to sand my doors to begin with, to start with. So I'll sand them first, clean them off really well, and then apply the second coat. I do, when I start applying the aqua coat, I do like to wear rubber gloves. So I got Raven gloves here, just something that's throwaway, disposable, easy to use, and it's not gonna cost a lot. They're the tools that I use. And now we're gonna move on to applying the product. We're gonna show you how we go about doing that. The first step in applying your aqua coat is to sand your finish. So we want to get that thing a nice profile so it bonds really well. I've got two right here that need to be sanded for their final coats. This will be a third coat. This will be two coats. But here's my door right here that's just got a lacquered finish on it. I have a one. 180 grit sandpaper right here, and I'm gonna just sand this thing, get it nice and ready. I don't have to overly sand, just a really light, fast sand. got a light sand on that. I'm going to wipe this thing down, get it ready to apply my aqua coat now. So I'm going to just begin applying some on the inside. The tools and accessories you typically see in all of our videos, you can typically find those tools down in the video description in our videos down below. This stuff goes a long ways. You don't need to take a whole lot of off or out of the container. I'm going to begin just applying it on my surface. And I'm gonna stay away, this is a raised panel door, so I'm gonna stay away from the edges. I'm not gonna be caulking the, the raised panels on this. Sometimes we'll caulk the doors, the caulk the panels, and where we live, you can get away with doing that because the climate is very dry. And so you can get away with caulking your panels. So I'm just gonna work it around close to the edges. And then that's gonna be my first coat right there. That's on the center panel, and you can see there where it's filled the grain. So that's one coat. I can look at it right here, the outside, it's filled really good, but we'll go along the outside. Just set this down here. So it is, it looked pretty good, but now that I'm 
scraping some on. I can see it's filling quite a bit of grain in there. So just keep applying that. It doesn't take a whole lot. It doesn't have a strong odor. It is water-based, cleans up very nice and easy. So I can get the edges, that looks pretty good. So you can see now this door is getting pretty close to being finished. I can rub my routed edges with aqua coat on a rag. So I got a microfiber cloth. If I'm really particular and I wanna fill grain on the edges, I can just rub it on those edges. And then any hard to get areas, if I'm trying to get into a corner, I can use a rag or I can just use my finger. So these little ingrain cuts right here, they're probably, right there, I'll show you that. And then I've got some routed edges right on here that it's built up, so I'm wiping that down. Just like that. The product sands really, really easy, and we're gonna show you the sanding process. So this one is just about ready to go. Let's wipe this down. All my edges are just about hit. And got one more edge right here. I'm gonna set this thing aside, and this takes about 45 minutes to dry, and then we can sand it, and then we'll move on to our second coat. So I got two right here, two coats on this one, one coat on this one. I'm gonna sand both of them, and then we'll apply our final coat. So I'm gonna apply a third coat on this, because this is a shelf that I want really, really glassy, glassy smooth. I'm gonna apply just two coats on the cabinets. On to the sanding of our aqua coat that's already dry. I've got this shelf right here. I'm gonna apply a different pad on here. This is a very super fine pad. It's around a 320 grit. You wanna sand with a 320 grit in between coats. Once again, this sander is really, really convenient for getting down in those raised panel, the profiles of the raised panel. You can see how it just conforms to whatever surface it's on. It's really, really nice, convenient, and fast. So now I've got my shelf sanded. I've got my door sanded. You can see the door, what it looks like here. It's, you can see all the grain is nice and filled. Definitely could take one more coat, put one more coat on this. This has got two coats on it. So I'm gonna apply a third coat on this shelf, one more coat on there, and then I'll sand that and be ready for my top coat. On with our final coat of aqua coat. I'm just gonna dust off my Surface now, if you don't dust it off, you can get contaminants mixed in with your aqua coat and you know, it could uh, not be nice and smooth application. Kind of gets in there and it gets a little bit grainy. So I'm gonna wipe that down. It's a good idea to have you know, two rags with you and I'll apply my final coat. Getting into some of like really hard areas, say if I had this panel right here caulked, because sometimes we do caulk our panels if I needed to get in corners. Sometimes I'll just use something just like my finger just to rub it down in there. But you don't want to leave a whole lot behind. It does sand you know, fairly easily, but the more you leave behind, the more you're gonna have to sand. You're really just after filling nicks, dings, or your grain. So I'm gonna apply my final coat. Got my whole assortment of trowels here. Here's my aqua coat. We'll, we'll do the large one here first. So here we go, I'm gonna apply it. So I can apply, take it out. I can apply it on with a small trowel and then spread it with a large trowel to make the process a little bit faster. This is looking 
really good and it feels now absolutely glassy smooth. Now this is going to look absolutely beautiful when done. Sometimes I like just going you know, across the grain instead of with the grain. It seems like it has a tendency to feel a little bit better. So we got like our routed edges here. You can just rub it with my rag. It's looking really nice. So that one looks really good. Wipe off the excess on my edges here. I'm going to do this door, show you one last door, final coat on this door. To get all work, you know, from inside out. So I'm going to work on my top panel here. This does, stuff doesn't have a strong odor at all, so you don't need to wear a respirator. It's, you can barely smell it. Down inside the, the raised portion, it looks, looks like it's fairly filled, but I can use, you know, that to get in there. I can use, you know, a little trowel like this to get down in there. Just go look around, search around. It's kind of interesting where you can find uh, little trowels like this. This was, this one right here came from the guys that did the window tinting on my vehicle. They were doing it and I said, hey, can I have one of those? And they gave one to me. Same with this one here. Once again, you can apply it down in there with a rag too. I can just, but you just don't use too much you don't want to get it where you don't want it. Like I don't want it down in the edges of my raised panel where it bridges that gap. So this is looking pretty good. I'll work on my outside edges now. This door right here, the end result when we eventually paint this, it would have looked really, really grainy. Now it's going to have a real nice factory finish. It's getting pretty close to being done. You know, you can you know some people are going to say, well, why don't you just use your coating and spray multiple coats on and build it up heavy enough that fills it from our previous experience in the past. You got to spray on a lot of material and in order to eventually get that glassy smooth finish, which you can't 100% get it without applying like an aqua coater or a grain filler, it's really difficult. You can if you keep spraying a ton of product on there, but it's just gonna, the end result's gonna cost you more money. Your product spraying it on there is gonna cost more than the aqua coat that you're applying. So this door's ready, it's set aside, it'll be 45 minutes, and then it'll be ready to sand. Same with the tabletop here. Set this aside. Sand it. Once I sand it, I'm gonna, my final sand will be a 320 and then it's ready to coat. And when we're painting cabinet doors, people are seeing these cup hooks in here and they're wondering what the heck we do about these holes we drill in our cabinet doors after we're done painting them. Another comment we get all the time is I cannot believe you just drilled holes in these beautiful cabinet doors. So before I get to talking to you about what we do about the holes, I'm gonna tell you why we put the holes in these doors to begin with. So the reason why we drill holes and put little cup hooks in these doors is so we can hang them on hangers like this. And hanging the doors on hangers like this, I can now hang them on a system like this and I can spray my doors hanging up and I can literally get four coats sprayed on these doors in one day. We use lacquers now and one of the reasons why we use lacquers is they dry a lot faster. They don't run as easy when you spray them, on, spray them on a hanging system like this and they're a lot more durable of a coating and they just look more like a factory finish. So I can take a lacquer, I can sit here and spray a door like this. I can get four coats on in one day. I can spray, I can prep them. I can spray two coats, primer coats, and two top coats in one day. The system that we used to use, here's a drying rack system, Right here, we used to spray our doors with latex paints. Latex paints, when you try to spray them hanging like this, are more likely to run. So we used to spray them on a system like this. I'd either set them on a bucket, or this is kind of an amazing tool right here. It's called the Spray Twirly from Paintline. All these products are from Paintline right here. And this drying rack right here is called the 50 drying rack. But we would spray them like this, and I would spray two coats on the back side of the door, and it's less likely to run, spraying them down like this, you can get them really loaded up. We would set them on buckets all over the house, but 
that was what we used to do. And now they got these really cool drying rack systems where you can set them on the drying rack like this. Like this, I can let them set on that drying rack, come back the next day, pull it off, and then I can spray the opposite side, which would be the top side. I'll spray two coats on it that day. I'm gonna lay it on the drying rack. It's gonna dry for a day, and then I'm gonna come back the next day and hang them. That's a three-day system. This system now that we developed, we can spray the doors and get them all done in one day, come back and rehang everything the next day, and it typically is about a day and a half. So we've cut our cabinet painting process down by half, and you can imagine how much money we make doing cabinets now. So that's why we use this system. It's a system, this drying, drying and spraying rack system. There's a drying rack, not here in the video, but these would go transfer from here and hang on a drying rack and dry. So that's why we do it. There are two little cup hooks. Cup hooks are right here. They're just simple little cup hooks that we buy at our local hardware store. We drill a three thirty second pilot hole, just about a quarter of an inch into the door, screw the cup hooks in, and now they can hang on these amazing hangers. They're drilled 10 inches apart, pretty simple. But you're gonna ask, you know, what do I do about the holes? So unscrew, after we're all done, we're gonna hang these doors, and it leaves these two little holes in there. They're not really that big of a deal. I've been painting cabinets now, for over five years using this method, and I've only had one customer ever realize that there was holes in the doors, and why is that? So this door right here, I just unscrew the cup hooks. This right here, um, there's two holes right there. You can see the handle right here. This is a bottom door. This goes on the bottom cabinets right here. And the bottom cabinets are the bottom door right here. It sits about six inches off the ground. So you can imagine six inches off the ground, you're never gonna be able to see those two holes I drilled. It's not gonna affect the integrity of the cabinet door. Now just the opposite door, if this was a top hanging door, the handle's down here, I'm gonna drill my two holes in the top. And the top of the cabinet is about that high. I can't even reach it and I can't even see it. So I'm not really worried about it because the customer can never see it. But if you're concerned about the holes that are being drilled in there, you can use this system and not drill the holes, or you can drill the holes and fill them if you're concerned about leaving them. And we've filled them before. The process for an uh, entire kitchen cab cabinet set is about an hour for one person to do it. You're just gonna use spackle. You'll just spackle it. Very simple. We would just put some spackle on our finger. We're gonna spackle that little hole right there. Let that spackle dry, and then our lacquer, because we're using lacquers, all we do is just take a natural bristle brush, and we're gonna brush some lacquer on the top of that. Handy little brush baggie right there. So I'm just gonna brush lacquer on there, one coat, and you're never gonna see it. Typically, most cabinets are white. The spackle's white, it just takes one coat. That's how we go about doing it. You can use caulking to fill that hole, but the caulking's gonna shrink a little bit, leave an indentation. But I have to say, you know, in five years, We've only filled the holes one time, one customer ever noticed. I think the customer got on a ladder to clean the top of the cabinets. The dust off the top noticed the holes. She said she couldn't live with the holes, so we just said we'd come back and fill them. And like I said, it took about an hour to fill them. So top ones, holes are gonna go on the top. Bottom ones, holes are gonna go on the bottom. Now, how do you know which one is the top one and the bottom one? When you remove the cabinet doors, just make sure you mark in one of the hinges T for top or B for bottom, and then you're gonna know. Put a piece of tape over that so you don't spray it because you always wanna have your labels, hinges, everything labeled. But the handle is gonna tell you a little bit about where you know, the cabinet door came from, but this one, label it T for top so you know it's gonna be up here, handles down here, drill your two holes, and away you go. Hopefully this video has helped you. The spraying racks and drying racks that you've seen right here, they're available on our website, which is theidahopainter.com. This one, I get a lot of people asking me this one from Paint Line right here, the PSDR spraying and drying rack. It's $425, that's what they sell it for. This spray toilet, I don't know how much that costs. This is on our website too. Uh, and if you do that type of spray system where you're concerned about drilling holes, you don't wanna drill the holes, it's an amazing system compact, you don't have to sit there and locate stuff all over the place. Okay, here we go. We're gonna get ready and we're gonna start putting together and assembling a light bar to you know, have this situation where we can light up a table, where we can see imperfections in cabinet doors to make our cabinet door painting process 
uh, a lot more efficient and where we can just get all the nicks and dings out of them. It's really critical that you do have a light bar. I've got this one sitting right here from me. And I did the search when I wanted to get a light bar eventually to do my cabinet repaints and have one that's out on the job site and something mobile I can take with me. I did a lot of research on the internet and it took me literally about three to four days to even find a light bar that I can purchase that actually had enough power that it would light up a table that it would show everything on there. There were a couple options out there at some really ridiculous astronomical prices. I think it was like $700, $600 just for a light bar to do cabinet uh, refinishing in the repaint industry. And I just thought that that was absolutely crazy. Is like, there's gotta be a better, simpler way that's more cost effective. So in my research, I found this light bar right here. And this is a light bar from Sanders Unlimited. And I believe the website is called sandersunlimited.com. It was shipped to me and it just comes in two pieces. And I was kind of shocked when I first got it because I thought it was, you know, the whole bar uh, ready to go. Now we just plug it in and um, I'd be able to use it. So it's this light bar right here, and I guess you would call this a transformer or whatever, it powers the light. It came also detached. It was just these two black cords right here, and I was like, oh my gosh, so now I've got a light, I've got a, I've got a light, I've got a transformer, and um, I'm sure somebody's gonna correct me because I'm, it may not be called the transformer, but I'm not an electrician. So anyways, it came with the cord and the cord um, to my amazement, shock or whatever, it was just right here. The cord was just cut off right here. It wasn't attached to anything else. This is an extension cord I purchased to make the attachments. I'm gonna walk you through, show you this entire process of doing this and what it looks like to do each one of these steps, you know, right now so you can have yourself a light bar. Our light is, mounted to a nice sturdy plate where it can't tip over, it can't fall off of the table. And we'll, I don't know, this is the table that I actually use. I use a table, this one right here, to do my sanding and inspecting. So I'll plug it in to our extension cord that we manufactured right here. It's all done. And this is, I typically never unplug this once it's plugged in. And there we go. There is our inspection table. The light, you know, you can tighten it or loosen it and you can adjust the light right here to give you, you know, the reflection needed on your table right here. So there you go, I can see a lot. Now all of a sudden a whole bunch of things showed up right here on this cabinet door. I can switch them right here. Look at this cabinet door. You can move it around. See this one right here, we got a, a gap right here, a couple gaps. And you can see I can adjust this light and it'll just um, give me a different cast across here. There it is, an inspection light. This is a, a absolute must have when you're doing cabinet doors. If you're really doing high-end cabinet doors and you wanna get that, that perfect finish on your cabinets with no imperfection. So I'm gonna be spraying today using an airless sprayer and I'm gonna be using a water-based PU. I've gone away from using a flammable lacquers or oil-based products just because of liability. And these industrial coatings, these waterborne coatings are absolutely amazing. We'll give you a factory-like finish. Today I'm gonna be using a Renner product, 1245, with a cross linker to give it some more chemical resistance and a little bit more durability. So I'm going to start spraying here very soon. I'm going, I've got a Titan 440 set up, a 440 impact. I'm gonna be using a 310 tip, a fine finish tip from Titan. Got the RX Pro gun. My pressure is set at the pump. A Titan 440 doesn't have a gauge, but I hooked up a Titan HEA gauge to the pump. So at the pump, I'm running around 1800 PSI to spray these doors. I'm gonna be spraying, I only got six of them, so I'm gonna be spraying them on a spray twirly right here from uh, paint line, spraying them down. I'll be spraying the backs first, sanding them using my inspection light to make sure these things come out like glass and perfect with no imperfections. And I'll be stacking them on the, the small sp uh, spray stack. And then I'll be flipping them over and doing the opposite side. So we're gonna get going with spraying the backs of these things. I'm gonna show you what it looks like using the inspection light to make sure you don't have any imperfections you know, on these doors. And then we'll get, um, get painting. So here we go. All right, so I got my inspection light and table, sanding table set up right here. 
got my Ekasan dustless sander set up where I'll be doing any type of sanding I need to do. And you see, I got my inspection light and the benefit to this is being able to set your, uh, your door drawer front or door front on a table like this in front of a bright light. You'll be able to pick up on any type of imperfections that you might not catch just uh, without any type of lighting assistance. I've got a big nick right here on it. I'm going to be checking fronts and back before I do any type of spraying and do any type of repairs. So this nick, a lot of the little nicks and dings, you can just sand them right out. This one's pretty deep, so I'll be using Bondo to fill that one. I'll begin checking all my doors and drawers here one by one to see if there's anything. These were just done custom made by a cabinet shop, sanded. I would think that all of them are in pretty good shape. Uh, this one right here, there's a little tiny imperfection right there. That's something that would actually just sand right out. Uh, I've got my uh, dustless Ekasan Series 2 um, vacuum setup right here hooked up to my sander. So I'm just going to be looking at these all really quickly to see if there's anything major I need to repair on them. I just see one that's I could sand out. This one doesn't have anything on it. Looks good. Excellent. There's a little pinhole right there. I'm not sure what that is, but we can fill that. So I'm just going to be inspecting these. It's very important to uh, inspect first, do any filling first. After the first um, coat, that'll be our self-seal coat. It will. Then we're going to be inspecting them once again and see if there's anything that we didn't catch the first time. That'll be our last opportunity to do any filling. And then we'll be shooting our top coat, hopefully your top coat, after you inspect them when they're all done. There's no filling to do. All I see is there's one door, a uh, couple little spots. This one, right here's a little spot right here that we could sand out right there. So we'll be working on that. And last one, we've only got six to do. So here's the last one. Nothing major. Um, we've got some nicks and dings right here. These will all sand out right here. I don't need to do any filling. So there's only two uh, that need to be filled. Here's a little spot right here, a little spot right here. Those will all sand out. Show you my sander setup I got. I've got multiple different uh, grits, uh, types of sponge sanding got anywhere from medium to fine to super fine these doors are uh, been sanded really well so i'm not going to use anything but just super fine or um very fine on them and then we'll get going so i'm i also got some pad savers i'm going to be using so i got my show you my echo sand sander right here this is a three by four sander if you do any type of cabinet painting especially professionally this is the sander, you, it's a must have, absolute must have tool right here. So three by four sander, you always wanna have a pad saver on it in case you wear through, you don't wanna damage the pad. It's a lot easier to replace a pad saver than it is the pad on your sander. Got it set on there. This is a dustless sander, so it's got four holes to take up the dust. Now I'm gonna be taking and sand in. Uh, I don't get any contours to work around. There's nothing that needs to be sanded on these edges. So I'm just gonna be using some flat sandpaper right here. I'm gonna look for, I've got 100 grit, got multiple grits. I'm gonna be looking for some 150 grit flat sandpaper right here. Got my multiple grits from of Eka Silk right here. So here's couple 150s. I don't think we'll need more than two. All right, so we're going to be looking for the ones I needed to sand. I had two that needed. This one is, you could tilt it back and forth and you can see really, really good. This one is in great shape, no sanding, ready to spray. Typically fill the ones with that need Bondo. I'd fill those first, but since I'm filming right here, I'm uh, like this one's got spot needs to be bondoed. So I got to go get my bondo. I don't have it right here yet. So 
I'm skipping that process for just a second here. The Bondo dries really fast, dries a lot harder than Spackle. It's better for filling small nicks and dings. Here's the one that had some spots on the face that need to be sanded. All right, I'm beginning to do my first coat on my seal coat on my the backs of the doors. I always want to do the backs of the doors first. So when their final coat is done, they're setting on the backs that's finished. So you're not finishing up with your backs and having them set on your the front of the door. That's going to be what everybody's going to see in the end. So always do the backs first. Seal coat's going to go on. This is not the top coat, so I'm not so concerned about just getting this amazing layer on there, but I want to get a good seal coat. I'm going to be spraying it one way and then cross hatching it the other way. So I got my sprayer ready to go. I'm going to show you what it looks like. So now if you're not vacuuming or dusting them off, you can just brush them off with a duster brush. Typically when I spray with an HVLP sprayer, I just unhook the gun and I blow it off before I spray it. But with an airless sprayer, you don't have that luxury. So you're gonna have to dust it off right here. Prior to my top coat, I wanna make sure these things are dusted and cleaned, cleaned really good after I'm done doing the final sand and prior to doing my top coat. Now I've got my uh, spray boost set up right here. I'm not inside of a house. So I don't have a ventilation system, you know, taking everything outside of the house. Um, we've got it all vented right out this garage door. Any dust can just carry right outside the garage door right here. And all it is is just gonna be dry dust, anything that falls um, or actually carries outside. <laughs> Good look at that first coat already looks nice and glassy. All right, one other pro tip I wanna explain. I got my doors, I'm stacking in there. You definitely wanna stack from top down. If you stack from bottom up as you slide doors in there, if there's any dust or anything or debris that comes off the door or your hands or anything, it's gonna fall down on your freshly painted uh, doors that you just did. So always go top down when you're stacking them. One thing I also want to explain is 
you know, airless spraying versus HVLP spraying. So one of the, the benefits to HVLP spraying is you're not gonna lose so much. You can see there's a whole lot of overspray falling down on the ground right here. So you're losing a lot in overspray. So you're gonna go through more product. You can put it on heavier, having it lay down like this. You can put on a nice heavy coat. And one thing good about these industrial uh, waterborne PUs is they can be sprayed with an airless sprayer and you don't have to thin them like you do with an HVLP sprayer. We're always having to thin our products, you know, typically like around 10, 15% with the, going through an HVLP. But with airless, it's nice and convenient, not having to thin your products, being able to spray them unthin, getting a nice heavy coat. Also, I do like spraying hanging because you can do both sides, you know, at one time, but we only got six doors to do. So um, I'm not in a hurry on this project. So I can do, you know, um, just do six doors laying down flat all in one day. So to show you, so I just got done with my six doors, sprayed all of them. This is the very first one I sprayed. It's almost dry. Now it's uh, dry to the touch in some spots. There's just a few spots that are wet. And that's one of the great things about these industrial uh, 1K PUs. You got 1Ks and 2K PUs and they dry extremely fast, unlike your typical water-based paints that you'd use from, uh, on cabinets that you'd get from your do-it-yourself stores or your local paint stores. These are just great products. So they dry super fast and they sand really easy. So I'll be able to sand this in about 10 minutes and then shoot my next coat on it. Or you can flip it over, sand the opposite side, do your primer on the opposite side, and then come back and do your top coat on the back so we'll let these things dry it's uh the paneling not the the most ideal paneling that goes in the center of these things because it does raise the grain up a little bit you're gonna have to do a little bit of sanding to smooth that out but it's sealed we're gonna get ready to do some sanding and show you what it looks like so there's only a couple spots that needed to be bondoed one of them this little pinhole showed up you know after spraying and we're gonna just take and put a little bit of Bondo. I don't need much, just a tiny bit. Bondo dries extremely fast. So I need these are Bondo that one, but you can see how these panels aren't ideal for panels because it raises the grain a lot. So there's a lot of sanding to get them really smooth final product, but but that's what our three by four sander is for. So I had another one that had a pretty good ding on it. And it must be the very bottom one. And it's not. How'd I miss it? There's six. It's somewhere. I missed the skipped one somewhere. It's not the top one. There it is. So this little nick right here, that's the only other thing I needed to Bondo in all of this. So you can see, I'm gonna take, they can, we'll start priming. I'm gonna shoot sand this and do my opposite sides or so I'm gonna sand this right now, the back sides and shoot my, and then shoot my primer on my opposite sides. Let's see here. I didn't say that right. Try to say it. Okay. All right, now we're gonna sand our back sides and then prime our front sides.
So I'm using a heavier grit. I'm using just my flat sand paper right here, the 150, to be a little bit more aggressive to sand these panels to get them flat and smooth. On this outside, it's already smooth. I don't want to burn through through to the wood, so I'm using a super fine uh, sponge, half inch sponge to hit the sides. So one of the reasons why I've chosen to start using Ekasan sanders and their Ekasilk pads is, man, they're the best sanding pads that I've used. They've last a long time, cut really good. It's a great product, the sander. These three by four sanders, great for doing cabinet doors. They're small, easy to work with, and are very versatile tools when it comes to, like I say, sanding doors. I can change pads, change uh, different size sponges, and sand away. Now I can begin, I'm gonna dust them off. And one thing I've noticed too from using these water-based uh, products that if you start sanding them, you know, a little bit early, what happens is the dust itself is a little bit heavy because I think it's a little bit saturated with moisture. So it doesn't completely uh, do dust-free sanding 100%, but you can see I've been sanding, I sanded all these doors right here and I've hardly got any dust, didn't have to use a respirator. So the, sa the sanding system is, it's excellent for doing dust-free sanding. If I would have let them dry for maybe you know, another hour more, it would have actually picked up more of the dust because the dust would have, wouldn't have been weighted, so weighted down with moisture. So now I'm gonna spray the opposite side. I'm gonna prime the opposite sides and then we'll do hard top coat on the backs. show you on our booth here so we're got our booth facing outside that way we don't have to have any type of ventilation system because it got you know all this fresh air you know moving in and out I'm spraying that direction which the whole entire booth bottom top sides is all sealed you are getting some dust coming outside and it's not wet over spray so you can see on this floor right here, the epoxy floor, that's just dry dust. Now, if you're concerned about, you know, overspray, once I'm all done, this is all with a, just a blower. It will, <coughs> it'll blow right off or just wipe right off with just, you know, a rag and um, some soap and water because it's just simply silica dust. Uh, if you're concerned about that, you can just even throw a drop cloth out a little ways. That way is when you're stepping out you're stepping out onto a drop cloth. So I'm not concerned about the dust because I always clean up at the end of the day and uh, wipe things down, clean things up. And it is once again, just dry dust floating outside the spray booth. Now you could actually just even put more drop cloths a little bit farther out, but it's all settling you know, right here. It's all going back towards the back of the booth and you can see where I'm standing uh, right there, but I'm spraying in that direction. I'm not standing on the sides and spraying to the direction where you know, wet droplets of paint are coming outside the booth. So I'm continuing right along. We are, I've got both sides primed now. We got front and back primed. Now I'm gonna start spraying the back sides. So we'll get our final coat on the back sides. We've already sanded the back sides. We'll let them dry and do our final coat on the front side and I'll give you some tips and tricks when it comes to spraying too. So I know some people are gonna ask probably, do I caulk panels? And when I'm doing repaints on existing cabinets, there are occasions when I do caulk the panels and I got a video explaining when and why I do that. When it comes to new wood panels, I never caulk the panels because I want them to look like a fa factory finish and you won't get gap bridging if you spray properly and, um, and use proper products and use proper techniques. So get ready. I do 
Um, on my final coat, I'm gonna be very particular about dusting things off. I got my air compressor. I don't want any dust on my final coat. So I'm gonna dust these off really well. And then we'll get going spraying. All right, now I'm gonna begin. We've changed our process a couple times in doing this, and I'm going to be doing my final coat on my backs. But before I do the back, the final coat, I wanna sand my um, seal coat on the front of the doors. That way, after I do my uh, top coat on this side, I'm not laying it down and sanding while that top coat is facing down on the paper. So I'm gonna be sanding now our seal coat on all the doors to get these ready for their final coats on both sides. So again, I'm using a flat sanding piece of sandpaper, a 150 on the flat surface right here. And on the outside, I'm gonna be using a super fine sponge right here, half inch sponge. I'll show you, you can see there's my inspection light is showing one little spot. And this is probably the spot that we originally uh, bondoed right there and it's still showing up slightly. So I'm going to put another coat of Bondo on that to get that to go away. Now that door is all sanded. I'm just gonna feel it real quick to make sure all edges feel smooth. And then I'll set that one aside, be ready to be sprayed here in just a moment. Inspection light has discovered another tiny little nick that I don't want to leave there. So I'm going to fill this one too. And once again, Bondo, this is the stuff that's going to fill little tiny imperfections like this where spackle will not. And it's, it dries really fast, sands really easy, and fills little tiny nicks and dings like that. couple tips when I'm spraying my top coat. Now on these new doors, when it comes to the cracks and stuff, I kind of angled my gun to get it on these edges and get it in the cracks, but you don't want to overbuild in the cracks. Otherwise you could get the product filling and bridging the gap. On the final coats, I'm going to be spraying it straight up and down so I don't get any more product down into the crack of the doors. Oh, here we go. Getting ready for Final coat, backside of the doors. Take a look at that, like glass. That's gonna gel out, be an amazing finish. So I'm blowing these things off, dusting them off. Then I'm hitting it with my duster brush just in case the blower didn't get anything off and then re-blowing it one more time. Take and inspect it. Make sure it's everything you like. Good to go. All right, now we're down to our final step, and that is actually painting the faces of the doors with our final coat. So this is 
another important process. One thing I like to do prior to spraying my final coat is because I've been sanding a lot and spraying a lot, I go in, wash my hands, make sure my hands are nice and clean because I'm handling the back sides of these doors, which is the top coat on the back sides of the doors. And you want to do that with clean hands. So here we go. All right, here we are. We got my setup sitting here right here. I'm gonna talk about the glaze I'm gonna be using today. It's a product from Brenner. This is 1338. It's a breakaway glaze. Water-based, dries really, really fast. I like this product. A uh, great product to use. I'm gonna be using the Apollo Precision 5 HVLP sprayer today with a 77 100 atomizer gun. So I'm gonna take off my cup load it up. They have just throwaway liners right here. I do even clean my liners out. I don't throw them away after one use. They are reusable multiple times. I'm not going to be testing viscosity. This is a very, very thin product. I know it's really thin. I'm not going to have to thin it out at all. I just use a Ford cup to get it into my PPS um, cup without making a big mess. You want to make sure that you shake your glaze up really, really well. You can just take Ford cup like this, and I'm just gonna put my finger underneath, transfer it over here, just like this. I'll just put it in there. Release however much I'm gonna be using. I'm just gonna snap it on there. Make sure it's locked into place. Now I'm ready to go. I'm gonna fire up my HVLP sprayer here, and we're gonna get ready to spray. So let's go into the spray booth and get on with the spraying. All right, here I am in my spray booth getting ready to spray. Some of the things you need to know, if you haven't got a lot of experience with an HVLP sprayer or the um, Apollo Precision 5, you can dial in the um, pressure at the machine. Try to use the lowest pressure possible when you're spraying with their HVLP. Since I got my pressure control at the um, HVLP turbine over there, my air control knob, I never actually used that with you when using the Atomizer 77 100 gun I always get it back all the way out get it back all the way out I'm gonna start off spraying I'm gonna turn my uh, material off so that's not gonna be any material flow then I'm gonna turn my machine on I'm gonna start backing out my material so and get the proper material flow I'm gonna turn on my sprayer turn on my spray booth even though I'm inside the spray booth right now you should wear a respirator because I'm teaching right now I'm not wearing a respirator because I'm gonna be doing some talking at the same time here I got the um, spray twirly from paint line. If you're accustomed to spraying your cabinet doors on a flat device like this, this is one method you can use it and then you transfer it to a stacking rack. Paint line has a stack rack that you can put it on a 50 rack. So I've got my pressure all set right, got my gun set right. And this, you're not worried about getting a really fine finish. We're just worried about getting a nice coverage of our powder glaze or breakaway glaze on this cabinet. I'm gonna be getting a full coverage on here and then sanding off what I want sanded off. At the end, my pressure is all the way down to 4.5. Now here we go with the spray in. All right, here we are at our sanding table now. I'm ready to start sanding my breakaway glaze. I've got multiple doors that I did. I got one, this is about five minutes ago. You can see it is still wet. This one's done about 15 minutes ago. It's just about dry, as you can see right here. I'm gonna show you how easy this stuff is to sand. I've got to my sanding table right here. I really like using a light bar. I've got a light bar set up right here. This was a light bar that I made. So when you sand your breakaway glaze, you want a very fine sandpaper. I'm using Echo Silk Plus. I got a super fine and fine. You don't need anything. You don't want anything rougher than that. And see, and it just, you barely have to put any pressure and the glaze just starts coming off. 
And what I want to do is on these cabinets, I just want some left in the cracks, some highlights in the cracks. It all just depends on what you want it to look like, the end result. Leave as much as you want or take off as much as you want to give you the desired result. And I typically like to take you know, most of it off and just leave a little bit of highlights left, but that's where your create creativity, you know, as a cabinet refinisher, you know, comes in. You can see I can, I can do different effects. I can sand it in a circular motion. If I want, it'll create kind of a different effect. Once you decide how you've done it, you've got to be able to, you know, replicate that from door to door. Once you get one door done, you can have that, have it set right next to you, so you can have an idea, do a comparison as you're doing your glaze. So I can leave some right here in the side, this edge right here, and that gives it a really nice effect to that routed edge. If you took off too much and you didn't like it, all you gotta do is just respray it and then resand it again. 15 minutes, my sprayer's still loaded up. Um, I can reshoot it and it's no problem. I got my Unita Ekasan Series 2 um, vacuum right there. It's a uh, HepiVac and so I'm gonna vacuum this off, see where I stand right now if I wanna do any more sanding. I'm gonna show you, um, there's a couple options you can do when it comes to actually taking off your powder glaze, just um, rubbing or buffing it off. Here is a Scotch-Brite fine Brillo pad. So you can use something like this or once again, this is um, a super fine or very fine sanding sponge, whatever works for you. You just don't want something rough that's gonna scratch your finish underneath. So scotch Brite pad is a little bit finer, slightly finer than what I was using. You can see you can, if you scratch in certain directions, I'm gonna give you just an idea if I go sideways, those scratches are gonna show up like that. So in a way, I'm pretty particular, I want you know, all my scratches go in the same direction when using this stuff. So I got two examples right here. Right when I get ready to spray them, I'm gonna set them in my spray booth. I'm gonna use my uh, Apollo Precision 5, just the air spray nozzle, and I'm just gonna dust that thing off really good, spray it, and then I'm typically gonna spray one clear coat on it, then I'm gonna bring it over on my inspection table, see if there's any imperfections or anything that I need to sand one last time and shoot a second top coat on it. But this one is looking really cool. It's got a nice, once again, like I say, nice metal um, finished look to it. So this is kind of like a dusty, dirty process. So you wanna make sure you know, wherever you're at sanding this stuff, that this stuff getting around, you're gonna be stepping in it possibly too, tracking it around, so just make sure that's not gonna be a problem wherever you're at. I'm gonna vacuum this off and think we'll be ready to shoot our clear coat. Okay, I got my gun all set up, got my spray pattern set up, I've been testing it in here. I think I'm ready to do shoot this door. Um, one thing, when I was doing my sanding again, went off to lunch, came back, forgot to uh, put on my gloves, when you're doing the sanding of the powder glaze, that stuff's gonna get all over your hands. It is kind of messy, so um, it's a good thing to always wear your gloves. And then after I do the sanding, I switch out gloves and put clean gloves on to start handling my gun with. Once I've sprayed this thing off, I've dusted it all off, if I don't like it, what it looks like here, and I wanna do a little bit of more buffing um, and getting some more powder glaze off, I would send it out. If I'm working with a crew, send it out with the guys and say, hey, fix this or fix that. But I'm ready to go, once again, just a sample. I'm in here talking, teaching, I'm not wearing a respirator. Make sure you wear a respirator even when you're inside of a spray booth spraying. But I'm trying to teach at the same time. I'm only doing one door. I'm not doing a full set of kitchen cabinets at this point in time. Otherwise, I would be wearing a charcoal respirator. So I got my first coat on the door itself. I did do a third pass on the door, so typically I'm gonna spray it one direction, then I'm gonna um, cross hatch it and spray it the next direction. Next direction. Once I looked at it, it looked a little bit dry on one side, so I adjusted my material flow up just a little bit because it wasn't, enough material wasn't coming out for the speed I like to spray. So I adjusted that, and now it's just right. I'm gonna set this one aside. I'm gonna show you spraying one hanging up now 
on the PSDR rack, we typically never spray our cabinets laying down because we're always spraying both sides at one time. It makes the cabinet painting process significantly faster when you get comfortable doing them hanging. I'm not gonna do anything with the backside, I'm just gonna clear coat it just so you can see it, but it typically would be finished both sides with powder glaze if we were doing the powder glaze. I'm extremely confident spraying it up, not gonna get any runs. Been doing it for a while, but the Renner coatings hang really, really well. I've really tried hard to get them to actually run and see you know, how much it takes to get on the run. It's actually pretty difficult to get this stuff to run. I would like right now that I got it here, sitting here in this light, I'm not too happy with you know, what was taken off right here. I'd probably send that back and have that buffed out a little bit because we've got some scratches going crosswise, but everything else, I like kind of some of these imperfections and stuff like that kind of gives it that aged antique look, but let's get on to spraying. This is a five-sided disposable leak-proof spray booth. And that means the floor has got plastic down here. I've also put down a cardboard sheeting on top of that, but if my cardboard sheeting leaked, there's plastic underneath so you're not gonna damage your flooring. It's a disposable spray booth, so once I'm done with this thing, I'm just gonna just take it, wad it up, throw it with all the rest of my stuff in the trash, and I'm done and ready to go to the next job site. You do, when you're dealing with, this is a white, you have to be very, very particular about your sanding marks or your sanding strokes on it or fingerprints or imperfections. So this was a fingerprint, I just left it on there, wanted to show you that these things are actually gonna show up in the end result once you clear coat it. So if you see stuff like that when you're in here getting ready to spray, send that back out to make sure that that is buffed out. I had the pressure on the Precision 5, it was dialed in right at 4.7 PSI, extremely low pressure. The lower the pressure, the less overspray you're gonna have. So try to dial that pressure down you know, to a lower pressure so you don't have a lot of overspray, but then you also wanna get a really nice finish. This Renner coating gels out and looks, looks absolutely amazing. When it's going on, it's kind of interesting because it look, does look a little bit orange peely, but believe me, just let it settle, give it 15 minutes, and it'll look like glass. So, and today we're gonna to be talking about doing touch-ups and the art of doing touch-ups. And doing touch-ups just takes a little bit of skill. It's a craft that with the proper tools and the proper training, you can do it and do it well. You can take a nick like this on this cabinet door and touch it up and you'll never see it. And some of this, the principles we're using here, that could be used on walls and doing other touch-ups throughout the house on your tram. And in order to do touch-ups and do them properly, you gotta have the right tools, right, Zach? That's correct. And so you got a few tools right here. I think, so why don't you show us what you got? Yeah, so I got a, an older sanding block just in case there's any rough spots on the edges or something like that. Uh, I keep that with me while I'm doing touch-ups on cabinets. And then I also have one of these two edge knives or a five in one or something like that, just to clean up some nicks or any foreign objects I may have gotten in the coating. So if you have something on the surface right here, you can just use that to scrape it off. That's correct. And there's, a multiple, there's multiple different uses for that two edge knife, but that's an amazing knife. Now you also have a big old arsenal of touch up brushes, don't you? Yeah, a bunch of different sizes and types. I use whatever I need to to get the job done. So why would you have so many different sizes of these touch-up brushes? Because you really don't want to use something like this on a small nick like that if you were going to just swipe it and just leave it because it's going to leave a whole bunch of brush strokes and it's just not going to look very well. So I'd use something like this, a nice little small one, and I would just dab it on there and you'll never be able to see it. Okay, you also have like, I see you got a spray can over here. And that's in your toolbox of touch-up stuff, right? Yeah, so this is made with the lacquer that we're using on these cabinets. It's uh, tinted to match that, and we get it um, the same time we get the lacquer, they just mix it up in a couple of cans for us, and that way we can spray the face of them if there's a big nick or something like that where uh, a brush is just going to show up no matter what you do. The spray cans come in handy in case you have to come back to the customer's house and do a touch up and you need to maybe respray the face of the door instead of loading up a whole HVLP sprayer. You got a spray can of the exact color of the lacquer and these spray cans work amazing. You can spray a door and it's gonna look just like it was sprayed with an HVLP sprayer. We also have these type of brushes. This is a white china bristle brush and we use white instead of black because these are more softer and more subtle. Hopefully I said that word right. 
but they're softer. And when do we use something like this, Zach? Um, so we would use this if any of these edges were light or if there's holes, because the system we use, we have to drill holes so that they hang on the clothes hanger. So we'll fill those holes and then we'll use this to go and touch them all up. And in certain cases, if it's, uh, you know, some on the back side, and we can get away with doing that on uh, a place where you wouldn't normally see it, uh, we can go ahead and use this as well. If you had to do a big surface area like the back side of the door, I would never uh, brush the front side of a door because it, this will leave a pretty good finish, but it's not a sprayed on finish. It's gonna leave a little bit of roping to it, but you can brush the back side of a door and get good, really good results. We do use rubber gloves, don't we? You got yeah, some gloves got on. Some what are right those now. things? Uh, these are some Raven gloves and they're going to be on the store here pretty soon, so. Yeah, so any of the tools are typically not all the tools but some of the tools and accessories that we really like we do sell them in our store on our website go to our website theidahopainter.com or our store the actual link to that is store.theidahopainter.com and you can find some of these really cool products that we like we found these raven gloves a while ago we really like them they're dust free nitrile gloves and they work really well and they're very resistant to chemicals and they're, and they're really we, tough too so we use them on all kinds of stuff so if you have any tips or tricks comments also leave them in the comments section below we would love to hear what you have to say if you got some something to share about doing touch-ups that is different than what we do just leave it below we would love to hear it and our community would love to hear it if you don't follow us on Facebook, check us out on Facebook. We've got a really cool group called Paint Life Members. You can go get all kinds of questions answered there from all kinds of people in our group. And we also follow that group also. But we're gonna deal with this, this nick right here now, Zach. So what are some of the things you're gonna do when dealing with this nick? You're gonna select the right brush. So select the right brush. And, and then you don't wanna just brush it like I was saying earlier, you just wanna daub it. So we're just gonna take a little bit of lacquer on the end of this. So you're kinda of just using a daubing method where you're just gonna daub it on that nick and not brush it on. That's and correct. How, how many coats is it gonna take? Um, it's typically gonna take about two to three coats. I would say with this one, it's probably gonna be three. And then you wanna be careful with the, the following coats as well. You don't wanna just brush those cause it's just gonna pull the lacquer back up. So we're just gonna take a little bit on the end of this brush here and then just dab it. So you're just gonna dab it on there. We're not gonna worry about priming it. It's just a small nick. The previous coating underneath was lacquer and just gonna dab it right on there. Now the lacquer is really thin. We're not spraying it on. It's really thin, so we're just gonna dab it on. And like Zach said, we'll let that set for about five minutes in two or three coats. We do have another situation right here. We've got a door face, and this door face right here had some blemishes on it, and we're gonna, instead of you know daubing or touching it up, we're gonna have to sand it, and then we're gonna have to reshoot it. So I'm gonna show you, Zach's got the spray can of lacquer. We've already sanded it and it's looking pretty good, just a final sand. We're gonna dust this thing off, and then we'll set it on our spray twirly right here from Paint Line. And this thing is really cool because we can just spin this thing around and shoot all four sides of this thing and all four edges of it, but the spray can works really well for this. So you go ahead and spray that yeah, there, Zach. And this is really just the perfect situation. We're gonna have to touch this up anyway, and instead of going through the whole process of setting up an HVLP, we're just gonna take this bomb cam that we already have laying at the job site, or in this case, in the academy, and we're gonna go ahead and spray this really so quick. So it's the exact same color. You're probably just gonna hit it one coat, one nice thick coat. Yeah, one one coat on this. Don't have to worry about running because it's sitting here on this spray totally right here. It's um, sitting face down and it's not hanging. So go ahead and spray that, there's that. Now you'd typically be wearing a respirator doing this, but for purposes of this video, so we can talk and work at the same time, we're not using a respirator, but always wear a respirator. So that's looking pretty good in that light right there. I'm liking that. So we're gonna let that set. If we needed to recode it, we can recode it in about five minutes because it's a lacquer. So there's a couple scenarios. We're gonna, you know, a couple scenarios with um, spraying. So we just sprayed this one. I'm gonna set it aside. So you, we have this China bristle brush right here, Zach, and um, we'll set this one here. We'll just do the backside. If you're gonna um, brush the, the back of this, 
just show them what it looks like brushing this thing. So this is a, a wider brush so you can cover a larger surface area with that. You're not gonna be using something this tiny <laughs> to try to. Right brush for the right job. The right brush for the right job. And this, these artist brushes, once again, we have, I mean, just a whole bunch of different styles and sizes of these things. We do have a set that we do sell on our store. That's a very versatile set that you can use to do these touch-ups. And these, the, we use these not only for doing lacquers, but when we're doing trim, trim, trim touch-ups on uh, the insides of houses too, all the woodwork. So now Zach's getting, he's getting a bunch of lacquer on there that he's gonna lay that out. I'll hold this for you now. So that's what it looks like if you're brushing the lacquer on. This is the back side of a door right here. And you know, I, I would be okay with the back side of the door being brushed in cer certain circumstances. But if you can spray it, it's gonna be best to spray it. That is looking pretty good. That's gonna gel out pretty nicely. We'll set that thing aside. Looking pretty good there, Zach. So there's what it looks like. There's a few tips and tricks. One thing, choosing the right tools. Choose the right brush for the right touch up and just daub it on, right, Zach? Daub it on. Don't brush it, just daub it. So Zip Wall made uh, these a while ago and then Trameco decided to one up them because corporate America. So um, these are really nice for setting up secure booths, okay? Um, now, you're not usually gonna have 16 foot ceilings. Um, this is a bit of an exception, but um, this is basically like an extension pole right here versus anyone use zip walls. They're not bad, but they're just really thin. They break up top. These are a little bit more heavier duty. Um, they cost more too. I don't remember how much. Are they cheaper? Even better, right? Um, Typically, oh look, he's drawing us something here. Typically what we're going to use these for are stabilization on walls and also in our corners so we can pull plastic around them, okay? Again, my goal is I want less stress. Um, I literally almost fired a guy while the booth around me started falling down because it wasn't secured properly. Like right in the middle of spraying the last couple of doors, the booth just starts giving because there's a lot of uh, pressure going in and out because we're ventilating everything, right? And, and the booth starts falling and you're just, uh, all I can think about is all the dust going throughout the rest of the house. And I'm just like, I was saying not nice things in my respirator about him and his mother. Um, like this is Chris's kitchen here. So he's got cabinets that go uppers and lowers that basically go around like that. You got the sink and you know, it's a kitchen. It's, you've seen one, you've seen them all. And he's got a dining room over here. So typically what we're going to do is we'll take that dining room table and we'll move that out into the living room and we'll use this space to create the booth. So an example like with this here, what we ended up doing is, what we would end up doing is we're going to do a seal here with a doorway. And then we're going to run plastic all the way around the outsides of these walls here so that it's fully protected. And then we're going to create another spray booth in here. So we're gonna do kind of a secondary wall with a little doorway over that way because if the majority of the spraying is happening in here, I wanna keep that all contained versus having it all open in here and then you risk that dust kicking out to the rest of your cabinets. Whew. We're gonna ventilate out, so we got a doorway here. You can look for doorways, you can look for windows. Um, the thing I love about painting is there are variables on every project and you have to problem solve it, right? So sometimes it's, it's gonna be a lot harder to get these sets or these things set up, but we're typically almost always gonna be able to have enough space in a connected dining room to set up a spray booth. Um, I think on, for this one, we ended up setting them up in the living room. So we had drop cloths out here, everything's covered. And then again, however many people you have at your disposal, sometimes what we'll do is I'll just have one guy that runs from here to this doorway to the rest of the house and then hands that door out so that we don't have to have a big gap. And then somebody hangs them all up. If it's just you and one other person, then this person's gonna get a lot of 
they're gonna get a lot of steps in on their Fitbit. So v ventilation is extremely critical when it, if you're gonna be dealing with lacquers, which now we're gonna be eliminating, you know, using, um, you know, water-based coatings. So this is actually, you know, a key, like John sitting in here spraying in this booth, we use a box fan. There's gonna be a box fan sitting in that doorway right there, and that box fan is blowing out. So everything that John's spraying, it's sucking everything in his spray booth out and so um and that's critical that it's keeping you know it, that you know that concentration of lacquer inside that booth you know, extremely low so it's not only important to have you know a ventilation point you know here sometimes we even have you know a fan inside there pushing everything that direction to that fan but we also have a fan in um, another source like there's this we had a window right here a kitchen window so we had a box fan in that window because we're trying to control the environment usually we'll also have usually outside the booth i'll have a fan that's like set up here pointing this way to push air into the space so that stuff's not coming out so we're circulating air in it can ventilate out one or ideally even multiple windows and then we'll also have like you said a fan sitting here or maybe out here if there's space again every Kitchen's gonna have a slightly different configuration. And then one more pushing everything outside that we're all tracking with that. Because we had, we had a, um, an air scrubber sitting here, pointing that direction, forcing stuff to that fan. Um, you know, it's good to have a fan here and you could have, you know, if you had something creating, you know, pressure right there on that, but you could also, you know, cause you have a lot of lacquer curing right here. You could have an air scrubber here pointing this direction pointing to this box fan, which is pushing stuff outside the house. So it's it's trying to develop some type of strategy, you know, to you know ventilate and move air in the right direction. As soon as you eliminate you know these fans, now you've just um, um, created basically a bomb sitting here. If you don't have any of that you know ventilation going on. So because usually what we're doing here is we're gonna, typically we're gonna take this double-sided tape and we'll run it right at that ceiling line going around these walls here so that we can tack this plastic down and then pull it down tight so that the walls are completely covered so you don't have dust. Sit. We have a lot of like orange peel texture here and I want the dust sitting on the top of the texture. And then we'll seal that down to the floor paper because remember that floor paper was done first and I want that plastic sealing and, and making a good seal. And then we'll cut a doorway wherever we need a doorway. So we'll run that along the outside right there. We'll cut a separate L to come in this way. And then where this plastic meets that plastic, we'll use the Super 77 from 3M, which is a spray adhesive. And you'll just take that, spray it along the plastic and then push the plastic against it. And it creates a, a great seal. And it's way better than trying to sit there with tape and, and seal that piece all the way in. I mean, one of the big questions now is like, if we're spraying with Renner coatings, do we have to go to this, all this extent of doing this? I mean, I, I'm still, I mean, you're not so concerned about having air scrubbers and all this ventilation now. So I'm still gonna have a spray booth. I'm still gonna have a booth within a booth. This is, you know, two booths right here. And um, cause you're, you're, you're this system is gonna create a lot less dust than our system, but I'm still, I mean, I'm still gonna to wanna to protect everything and, and you know, and be a little bit concerned about dust, just push any type of fumes that may be coming out. Cause this is really, I mean, it's, it's literally that area is pretty dang small that we spray in. It's, it's enough where somebody can spray and pass a, you know, a door in and out of that booth. So you're still gonna wanna ventilate here. I probably still would wanna ventilate there. I don't think I need an air scrubber here. I don't think I need an air scrubber there. You still need some positive pressure there and I probably don't even need that there. These things drying in here, you're probably not even gonna smell anything. Nobody's, it's not even gonna bother them right there. So you've really, I mean, you've really eliminated the, the need for air scrubbers and you know, half your ventilation. So what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna kind of put a pin in this right here. Um, we've got some light. This system is designed for spraying your cabinet doors and specifically, we're gonna be checking out these hinge hooks that they recently released. Now these, actually clamp inside the holes in your hinges, hinge holes. And the advantage here is that you're able to put this on the PSDR system where you have full control over the spin. But the way that we normally do it is that we'll normally put in some cup hooks into the side of the doors. We'll drill in, 
put those inside, and then we have this very secure system for hanging the doors. Now that's what we generally do, and we have a video specifically on why that works, and this isn't really a problem, but hey, you screw, screwing holes in perfectly good cabinets, I get it. What we're testing today is exactly how strong this clamp is, and it's actually really important because when you think about it, if you were to lose this in the process of spraying your cabinets, you'd be in rough shape. You're probably going to end up buying a new cabinet, which is exactly what you want on any cabinet job that you're doing. So I'm going to be using this very scientific and uh, very precise technique of throwing a ball at it and seeing what happens. See, when I hit it on the side like that, it applies quite a bit of force to just one side. Like, if anything was going to yank it out, it'd be something like that. That was straight on. So, one of the things we got, we recently posted a video similar to this where I'm just slapping one of these hangers around. We posted that on Instagram, and one of the things that people commented was, what happens if you make those hooks actually sharp? And for one thing, they actually are sharp already, and they do a, that's a big reason why it actually is doing a good job. But I'm gonna try to do a before and after with a little bit of science and a little bit of modding to see if we get any different results. Uh, I was throwing the ball hard before, but I'm really gonna see if I can break a window or something with this. If nothing else, I'm wearing it down, you know? Each hit has to be doing something. You're not gonna tell fire down. Wow. To be fair, if we got Muscle Man Chris over here, he could probably, he could probably knock it down in one, but I'm doing my best. It's like a carnival game. This poor door. It's impossible to know exactly how hard I hit that thing, but I'm gonna take it inside, I'm gonna use a Dremel tool to sharpen the edges on those hooks, and then I'm gonna take it back out here to see if there's any significant difference, if we can actually get it to stick into the sides of those hinge holes. So just by moving this thing around, I'm already feeling a big difference and it's not it's not good all right let's uh, start with around the same force that I was going with before dang it's hardly yeah okay I did better that time. Because you put this up and you didn't do the stretchy thing where you tried to get it to actually puncture the sides. I did. You did? Yeah. Oh. So maybe I'm just bad at putting this on is what you're saying. Um, all I gotta say is, I'm, uh, sorry about your cabinet, Chris. Uh, I mean, this was inevitable, I suppose. And this is precisely why you you want your cup hooks to be this sturdy. So, um, I'd highly recommend not throwing balls at them, or especially throwing balls at the hanger itself. Well, say again? I think that wraps it out. Um, <laughs> so 
So after sharpening this and testing it out, I have two theories as to why these come exactly the way they do. Number one, you probably don't want razor sharp tools in the bag that you're just reaching out trying to get. Um, kind of safety hazard, I'd say. Uh, but second of all, the reason on certain ones it really seemed like this didn't have nearly as much hold is what we theorize is probably a lack of surface area to create the amount of friction that you want. So in my opinion, the way these come is actually the exact level of sharpness that you want for the most secure hold. So there you have it. We've been testing out these EFC hooks. Now the question is, would I actually use them myself? You know what? I'm really comfortable after all the years painting. I've been painting for 18 years now. Been painting cabinets for almost as long. I've been drilling holes and screwing these one inch cup hooks inside these doors for probably about six years now. I've never had any complaints. I'm comfortable with this method. I'm a lot more comfortable with how, how they hang and actually secure. I've never had a door fall off with these type of hooks right here. Here's the EFC hooks. We've been throwing, messing around, all joking aside, they have been performing a lot better than I ever expected, but if you really don't want to drill holes in your cabinet doors, you're just against it, this is an option, the EFC hook. Now let's put it to the real test. So there you have it, it's all about cabinet painting. Hopefully you got some tips or tricks out of this that's gonna make your cabinet painting process go easier, smoother, and like a professional did it. If you got any tips or tricks yourself, leave it down in the comment section below. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, that way you get notified every time I come out with a new video. Thank you for checking this video out, and we'll see you on our next video, out.